Everyone, <clears throat> please join me in welcoming robot builder, model maker, and Mythbusters television host, Grandy Mahara. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you, Grandy. Good morning, Xamarin. How are you? Excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our show, and it will become apparent in a while exactly how this applies to you. But first, um, are you all familiar with the show, Mythbusters? It's been around for a while. I'll give you a brief rundown. So the basic premise of our show was to take urban legends, like uh, are there alligators in the sewer, or if you eat pop rocks and drink Coke, will your stomach explode, that sort of thing, and use science to prove or disprove them. Our cast were not only hosts, but also builders, people with uh, varying backgrounds, mostly special effects, who designed and built and executed all the experiments. For example, drafting a big rig. If you get really close to a big rig, will you save fuel? The answer is yes, you actually will. And in fact, the closer you get, the more fuel you save. There's just two problems. Number one, it's illegal. Number two, it's very, very dangerous. So please don't do this. If you uh, aim a machine gun at a tree, can you cut the tree down like in Predator? The answer is yes. If you have the right machine gun, I highly recommend a Dillon minigun, 2,000 rounds per minute. <laughs> we also did ancient myths. Uh, one was called paper armor. Apparently, in ancient times, there was armor that had been made out of several layers of paper folded together. It is puncture resistant, shock absorbent. It is lightweight. The only problem is that when it gets wet, it loses all of those properties. <laughs> now, a lot of these things we tested on ourselves. We became human guinea pigs. So for this one, this was uh, for Goldfinger. For various reasons, we couldn't paint carry gold, so we chose silver. And it was about the toxicity of having all the pores of your skin covered with this particular substance. Uh, spoiler, she survived, so no worries, everything's good. Um, seasickness cures, one that is not one of my personal favorites, for obvious reasons, but we tried all these different things like, um, you know, there's uh, these shock bracelets, a little thing that you, you put on a pressure point. Uh, most of that didn't work at all. What did work were ginger pills, though. And of course, these are non-pharmaceutical remedies, so uh, if you, if you want to go on a route that where you don't use any sort of uh, drugs, which do work, uh, you can go with ginger pills. Slap some sense. We built a slapping machine <laughs> to slap each other. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, it's, if someone's hysterical, you should be able to slap them and they come back to their senses, which actually does work. So um, I wouldn't suggest going around slapping each other. But if you're in that situation and you, you need someone to sort of snap out of it, you can, you can slap them. Uh, slapping them will work. I don't know if you can slap them or not. And um, uh, cold feet, which is if you are incredibly frightened, the, the phrase is, you know, if you're, if you're Afraid of something, you get cold feet. So they asked me, uh, Grant, what would make you afraid, honestly, and uh, I said, well, silly of me, of course, to answer honestly what would make me afraid. I said, well, I don't really like spiders. They're like, great, that's awesome. We're going to build a, a transparent box with two holes in it, one at the top and one at the bottom. One at the bottom goes over your head. The one at the top, we're going to drop 25 live 
pink-toed tarantulas on your head. Having had this experience, I can tell you, and they put uh, thermal imaging on my feet, your feet do actually get cold. <laughs> to the tune of about 10 degrees, which is significant. And that is because all the blood, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a biological, physiological reason for it, and that's because all the blood rushes to your major muscle groups and out of your extremities so that you can have that flight or, or fight response. Another aspect of the show, as I mentioned, is that unlike most TV hosts and on these build-type shows, we actually did build everything. My background is in electrical engineering, but I also spent 10 years at Industrial Light and Magic making things, making physical things in the model shop. And so uh, you know, welding, working with metal, this is uh, for the Rocket Man episode, I'm making a, a rocket nozzle, a steel rocket nozzle. In addition, over the course of the show, I designed and built dozens of machines. Because in some cases, we couldn't test on ourselves. It was too dangerous, or we needed something superhuman, like in the case of the odd job hat thrower from the James Bond episode. Odd job is this giant henchman. And he's got a steel-rimmed hat that he throws and decapitates a statue. We tried this. Uh, we weren't strong enough, and we thought, well, maybe Odd Job is, you know, this giant superhuman guy. And so we threw it harder, and so I made a machine to do that. <laughs> I made a machine to smash frozen heads, like in Jason 10. Uh, you know, tried to curve a bullet, like in Wanted. This one was for safety reasons. Uh, we did try, by the way, to, you know, in Wanted, the... Uh, the kid has, he is essentially a superhero. He has superhuman reflexes and strength and speed. And so there's this technique where you supposedly swing the gun, and as you swing it, you fire it, and that can cause the bullet to curve. Uh, this does not work in real life, <laughs> unfortunately. Sad to say. I also do know that a, an eighth inch sheet of single pane glass is enough to decapitate a person in winds of only 30 to 40 miles per hour. So bear this in mind, if you are in a place that has hurricanes, uh, that, that this could be a real danger possibility for you. It certainly surprised me. But this machine, based on a pitching machine, was one that I designed and built because we didn't really have anything that we could order off the shelf that would fire a piece of glass at speeds of, of that magnitude. And often, our myths resulted in something fiery and or explosive. Now, you might be asking yourself, what do the worlds of cross-platform software development for mobile applications and science-based reality TV have in common. They actually do have quite a bit. Essentially, we are both in the business of creating things that have never been made before. Sometimes we have to make the tools to make the things that have never been made before, because those don't exist either. What I'd like to share with you are some of the things that I've learned over the course of 10 years of myth busting that are applicable to problem solving, because that's essentially what we do every day. We make things that no one has made, few people have thought of, and along the way, we solve dozens and dozens of problems. But first, let's, let's talk a little bit about innovation. Innovation starts with creativity. For me, Innovation started with Lego. This, this set number 357, the Legoland Fire Station, 1973, was my first Lego set. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know if at the time 
my parents realized what they were starting with Lego. They probably just thought it was a, a block set, he would like it, whatever. But as it turns out, Lego is an amazing tool for innovation. Play stimulates creativity. Using what you have to make what you don't have. For example, in those days, right, let's, let's go back, the blocks were just blocks. You didn't have all these fancy, nowadays, Lego's a little different, right, with all the licenses. There were all these kind of cool curved pieces, but back in the day, block was a block. They came in a couple of different sizes, but essentially they are all blocks. So you had to get a little bit more creative about how you were putting your blocks together. This is engineering at its core. It's a modular design. Lego is a system. The blocks fit together in a certain way. What makes it a great design tool, much like software, is that it's easily reconfigurable. If you're machining a part and you make a mistake, nine times out of 10, you're going to be making a new part from scratch. With Lego, you take the block off, you try something new. It's very quick. It's very easy to reconfigure. It's very easy to try out a prototype, and then you move on from there. Not unlike the Matrix. There are rules. Some can be bent. Others can be broken. Now, in the context of Mythbusters, our motto, failure is always an option. It was printed on all of our t-shirts, all of our hats. Failure is always an option. And prior to working on Mythbusters, I was afraid of failure. It took 10 years for me to begin to accept the idea of failure, because the real motto should be, failure is always a design tool. Get used to the idea of failing at something because you learn from each failure. If you never fail, you never learn. In the case of the Jado rocket car, this myth was about an Impala that a guy had taken several Jado rockets, strapped them to the Impala, as the myth goes, fired it off, and they find the, the smoking hulk of a car embedded into the side of a mountain about a mile away. In order to execute this in real life, we actually tried this three times. First time was on a dry lake bed using hobby-grade rockets. We, we couldn't get our hands on a, jet a real jet-assisted takeoff rocket. For some reason, they just don't like giving those out. So in the first iteration, which was not a failure per se, but it didn't exactly cause takeoff. We had these hobby-grade rockets. Since then, we stepped up our rockets. The final experiment had uh, six of them in a row. We put them in the center of gravity. In the original experiment, we tried them on the roof, and that ended up pushing the front down. So in order to get flight, you put them right in the center line, along the center axis. We took out the engine and addressed the weight balance of the car. Again, uh, the second attempt failed because of a triggering problem, but we figured for this one, we would address the weight. We built a giant ramp out in the middle of the desert because in the myth, the guy, I think, hit uh, a bump or something, and that's what caused him to take off. So all right, no more fooling around, built a giant wrap. And in the end, we did manage to get flight. Unfortunately, it wasn't that long. <laughs> which leads us to one other point, which is very important, which is understand the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation with the Jado rocket car is that an arrow, 
a missile, uh, a jet fighter. They all have a number of things in common. And one of the major things that they have in common is that they are not shaped like an Impala. <laughs> the reality of this situation is that without significant modification, this Impala is never going to fly. There are dozens of ways to do any given task. For example, the coffin puncher. This came from a myth uh, from Kill Bill, where Uma Thurman, who is uh, playing a character called the Bride, is buried alive. And she has to punch her way out of a coffin uh, just with just you know, a few inches of punch at a time. In order to test this, we required a machine, which I designed and built, to continuously punch the lid of a coffin for hours and hours, like eight to 10 hours nonstop. There are a number of ways I could have done this. I could have used a crank. Uh, this particular way used an air piston, a cylinder inside of there with its own air tank and a bunch of timers. For Vector Vengeance, it was all about kicking a soccer ball or accelerating a soccer ball very, very quickly. And in this one, I had three different machines that I built to do the same, same job. By the way, I can, I can actually kick a soccer ball at close to the speed of sound. I know, it's a lot. All this to say that your way, or the way that you are thinking of, may not be the best or most efficient way. And so the idea of compromise has to come into play, particularly when you are working on a team or in a small group that requires collaboration. Your way may not be the best way, so be open to other ideas. I think one of the most significant things that we came across working on Mythbusters was this idea of changing the reference plane. Now, for a reference plane, most of us have a single reference plane that we live in. We get up in the morning, uh, we put on our clothes, have breakfast, drive to work. And it's fairly linear. And it's the one that we are used to looking at. But you see, in physics, what you can do is essentially take the camera off of yourself, off of your personal reference plane, and change it to another perspective. For example, this is a myth called Hotel Parachute. Not saying that you will have to escape this hotel, but if you did, what would you use that is available to you. Let's say that there was you know, a fire and you had to escape from your hotel room by jumping from the balcony, which I do not recommend. I'm just saying hypothetically. What could you use that was in your hotel room? And so we set about to test different materials, uh, obviously, linens, but also shower curtains, duvet covers, things like that, that we could adapt. The only problem was that we didn't have a space big enough in our shop to continually test these materials one after the other. So instead of throwing the thing out and using the parachute to go down through the air, we said, why don't we fire the air up and into the parachute. So you can see here, Tori is actually standing, not the safest thing in the world, but he's standing on top of a fan. So we're looking at this from, not from the reference plane of on the ground observing, but from the reference plane of the parachute itself, having the air accelerated past it. Similarly, 
for another myth called snowplow split, where a guy drove his car directly into a giant snowplow at very high speed and apparently split it all the way down the middle, we couldn't accelerate our car to incredible speed. We, we tried this in real life, by the way, and uh, it did work pretty well, as a matter of fact. But we wanted to split all the way through. The myth was that he split his car in half. So we want to split all the way through the engine block, through the seats, through everything, all the way two halves of car. That's what everybody's picturing. In order to do this, we had to accelerate to 400 miles an hour. Now, on our show, we had access to a place called New Mexico Tech that will give you, I don't think you can actually get a PhD, you can get at least a master's degree in blowing things up. They have a rocket sled track at their facility. But the thing is, this was about a car going very, very fast into a snowplow that was stationary. They said, no, actually, you can't accelerate the car down the track at 400 miles an hour. It will never hold up. It will just break off. So we changed the reference plane. And instead of accelerating the car, we accelerated the plow, which is what this is. And another rocket sled experiment that we did. OK, look, it's just a thinly veiled excuse to do cool stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Also, we teach science. But whenever we are able to use a rocket sled, we will. In this case, it was about uh, a car being sandwiched between two semi-trucks, a small car. And again, we could not accelerate the car into this, this wall, this plane-type surface, so we accelerated the wall. And in fact, I have video of this. Uh, let's roll it right now, and you can see what happens. The car disintegrates. <laughs> it's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> and you see that little thing that comes after? That's the booster, booster rocket pack. So OK, there you go. <laughs> Now, another thing that we specialize in, as I mentioned, is having situations where the tools that are available to you are not exactly what you need. So in our case, we will take an existing tool and adapt it to something else, some new way to do it. For example, if you <laughs> are apparently a Ghostbuster and you need to guide a giant stream of electricity at a ghost, you use a Tesla coil and a super soaker. This is a shock watch sticker. What we needed was a cheap and easy way to measure impacts. On a show like ours, we actually had a crash test dummy, and that crash test dummy was a member of the cast. He had a name. His name was Buster. And in order to measure the impacts on Buster, we had these stickers, which are made for shipping things across the country. And you want to see if your uh, computer system somehow got damaged by being dropped. How you would normally do this, now, now a tool for this did exist. But you know, a Thor 2 dummy is like ten dollars to $20,000. And that's not the kind of budget that we had on our show. So we had to get creative. In order to measure punch force during one of our myths, we didn't really have a punch force sensor. And so the sensors that I'm holding there, the green things, those are, um, those are a matrix-type force sensor that just happened to be appropriate. So we taped it to a punching bag, because sometimes you have to get creative. 
for measuring pressure waves underwater, what Jamie is holding there, the green circle with the silver dome in the middle, that's a diaphragm. That's a calibrated sensor. And we came up with a technique where we had a pipe. This is underwater, so a lot of normal sensors might not work. We had a pipe. And the pipe had one of these on either side. It's a, it's a diaphragm, a, a very thin metallic diaphragm. And once you exceed the calibrated load on the diaphragm, it punches through, indicating it's, it's a way of indicating make or break. A technique, and you'll see the thing that Adam is holding on the, on the right, that's the pipe. It's a technique that then went into a scientific paper and ended up being a technique that has been used quite a bit since then. What derails your creative process? What derails your development process? We do. We do. Our ego at believing that my way is the right way, the only way. Stubbornness, not willing to listen to other ideas, or not willing to change your reference plane and change the way that you are looking at the problem to try and find another solution. Bring up Adam and Jamie. There's a famous story that you probably have heard if you're a fan of the show, and it goes that Adam and Jamie hate each other. That's not true. They don't hate each other. What is true is that what they said was, we don't hang out after work together. The thing that's significant about that is that they have two very different ways of looking at the world. Jamie is kind of a, a brute force. He grew up on a farm. He is a brute force engineer. When I first met Jamie, by way of example, we were fighting robots together in robot wars. I was on a team for ILM. His robot was called Blendo. Jamie's idea of engineering, of making a fighting robot was to take a three horsepower lawnmower engine, attach that to a giant cooking wok turned upside down, and then put steel blades along the bottom and have it rotate at several hundred RPM, such that anything that touched it would literally explode. Adam's kind of engineering is very iterative. He, he, he tries different things at, at a rapid, rapid pace. And if you've ever worked with him, you know where he's been because there's just a mess that follows him all around the shop. One of their greatest strengths is that they do have these different ways of approaching a problem, two very different viewpoints. But in that way, they are able to come together, work out between them, you know, why is your viewpoint better? Why is mine better? What parts can we put together? Because the ultimate goal is testing the myth, or in your case, coming up with a product. So that's pretty much it. That's, that's all of the tips that I have for you in the 10 years that we have learned, but they are valuable ones. Now, unfortunately, Mythbusters is over. It's been four, uh, 14 seasons of blowing things up and uh, having a good time teaching science. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Microsoft. Thank you, Xamarin. Thank you, all of our sponsors.